pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Happy Friday, everyone. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and this weekend, we're storing Joe's mom's Harley. Plus, we're bringing you a great episode of the show. On today's podcast, we'll discuss making big purchases. When is it time to stretch? Also, are rich people lonelier? Joining us from LenPenzo.com, Huey Lewis and the News. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's Len Penzo. But Len Penzo can harmonize like the best of them. And from Afford Anything, Paula Pant. And the author of Control Your Cash, it's Greg McFarlane. God, I hate that guy. On today's Halftime Fintech Friday segment, we'll talk about a revolution in homeowners insurance with Asaf Wand and Rick McCathrin from Hippo. And here he is, the guy who's the ringmaster of this circus, Joe Saul Cihai. Yes, I am. Hey, everybody, welcome to another Friday on the Stacking Benjamin Show. I am, as Doug said, Joe Saul C. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And you know what? A lot of people say that if you have a thimbleful of inspiration and sacks of money, you can make that into a ton of money. And I actually think it's even the opposite. I think if you have a thimbleful of money and lots of inspiration, that can go equally as far. You don't have to start with a lot of money to make things come true in your life. And man, we're going to talk to a startup at the halfway point that's all about that. We're also going to talk about some big money purchases like Doug alluded to with our crazy cast of characters. But first, we got to say a big thank you to everybody who's used our sponsor, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money because when you head to magnifymoney.com guess what you find that checking account savings account and those other products that you use like your credit cards and loan repayment options those aren't as good as ones found in other places why would you shop at just one place when you can shop at a place online that will compare all the different choices that you have it's funny somebody reached out to me the other day saying well such and such bank has a 1.2%. And I know from doing this show, you can find 1.4% on a savings account at Magnify Money. All you do is head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. That tells them that we set you, which is always good for my relationship with Nick and Brian and my sponsors over there at Magnify Money. And then you just, in a very short couple clicks, you'll find those financial products that you're looking for. So whether you're trying to pay off your debt afford that next car or you are repaying the student loans, whatever it might be, stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. This podcast is also sponsored by the learning half of Stacky Benjamins. You know how we tell you if you learn anything, keep it to yourself? Well, keep it to yourself while you're headed to stackybenjamins.com and scroll down just a little bit until you find our partner Kathleen has lovingly designed some ways for you to learn Written in the same style as the Stacking Benjamin Show, two of our courses, Learn How to Legally Cheat on Your Taxes and Learn How to Save Half Your Income, are available now. More courses are being added all the time, but let me tell you what we've got. When it comes to your taxes, whether you miss the first filing deadline, you've got one coming up in just a couple of weeks, or you're somebody that wants to know how to fill in everything correctly on your taxes when April comes around, well, Learn How to Legally Cheat on Your Taxes is for you. Here's how it works. My clients were mystified about how taxes work. And when somebody sat down with me and just walked me through the two pages of a 1040 and through the itemized deductions page, you know what I found? I found that it was much easier for me as their advisor to find deductions, exemptions, areas to save money on taxes. I also learned how structuring your income works. I learned a ton about what the government's looking for on my taxes, which meant that instead of waiting until the last minute and then hoping to put Humpty Dumpty together again when it comes to my tax form, I can then make great decisions all year because I know what I'm looking for. And that's how you're cheating on your taxes. You feel like you're cheating, 
because you're always identifying opportunities where your neighbors and your friends are not. And when it comes to saving half your income, let's say you try to save 50% of your income, you push it. We're going to show you how to do that. And guess what? Even if you fail, what if you save 40% of your income? How bad would that stink? Wouldn't stink at all, would it? More money in your pocket means a better, better road ahead. StackyBenjamins.com and scroll down to our courses, How to Legally Cheat on Your Taxes and Learn to Save Half Your Income. All right, that's that. Really excited about the company we're going to introduce you to halfway through the show too, Hippo. Uh, Man, uh, if you've got homeowner's insurance, you own your house, mm, you're going to want to listen to what Hippo's bringing. They're not available everywhere, but they're going to be soon. And I'm so excited about the technology. It's a great interview. Baby, we got a great show. Let's get this party started, huh? All right, now let's walk across the basement here and crank up my dad shortwave for another fun week. And I think we got the band back together. Let's start from, uh, well, the people we know where they're at. Why don't we start in Las Vegas where I believe Greg McFarlane from Control Your Cash joins us. Yes, I am. Unincorporated Clark County, actually. But yeah, Las Vegas is close enough. <laughs> Fantastic. So how far away is Las Vegas then? The boundary actually goes just within a few blocks of my house. It's very um, gerrymandered, if you will. So what happens? I'm guessing that there's there's some type of legal requirement that's keeping Greg McFarlane out of city property. Like they've I, got- I just... I just don't want the fireman to come to my house. That's all. Let it burn. <laughs> burn it to the ground. But then you get the insurance money, Greg, so it's better that way. Exactly. Speaking of, uh, I, I, I don't even have a segue. Let's just go to Los Angeles. We're peeking out of his bunker right now. The master from Lenpenzo.com, Len Penzo himself. Joe, how are you, my friend? And boy, is it great to have everybody back together again. It I, is, just, I just love it when we have the band night. I know. It feels like it's been forever, doesn't it? It does. I, you know what? And I don't know how many weeks it's been, but... Gosh, it feels good, and I love all of you guys. Just come here and give me a hug, everybody. Come here. Bring it in for a group hug. Let's <laughs> hug it out. Speak, yeah. Yeah. So Len already told uh, everyone, I guess, who the third member of the band is, but she's not where she usually is. I'll let her tell you where she is. Live from Portland, Oregon, we've got Paula Pant from Afford Anything. That's true. I am uh, I am recording this while sitting on the floor of Powell's Bookstore in Portland, Oregon. One of the biggest bookstores in the United States. Yeah, I believe Powell's in Portland and The Strand in New York are the two biggest bookstores in the U.S., East so, Coast and West Coast. So which section of the bookstore are you sitting in? So I was actually in the personal finance section until recently. Nerd! And then when – I know, right? You know what's cool about this place? In addition to their personal finance section, they have a separate retirement section and a separate investment section. Shut the front door. It's true. It's like that well stocked in personal finance books. It is. Hey, I think what's cool. What's cool about Pals is that they will let you do a podcast while sitting at the floor, <laughs> not buying anything. <laughs> right. Well, let me is a strong word. What uh, I think it would be more accurate to say, I haven't gotten kicked out yet. I think that'll be the best part of the show if that happens in the <laughs> middle. If we hear Jerry, the manager, come over to you. <laughs> Good, uh, it may happen. I th- mean, the, the next 20 minutes have yet to be determined. I love it. Can hey, we- Paula, I, I assume uh, Control Your Cash is still sold out there too, right? You know, I didn't see any copies. I can only assume that it's because Greg hasn't autographed any and uh, that as soon as he does, they will be front and center. Well, if it's trading right. for thousands of dollars, that hard copy on Amazon, I mean, imagine if you could pick one up at Powell's, how great that would be. <laughs> I would be flipping his books. Everybody's wondering when we're going to start, so why don't we get this show going? We're going to go to a place that we always go on this show, ESPN.com. Actually, I don't think we've ever gone to ESPN.com. Houston businessman Tillman Fertitta. It's a, a, a Fertitta, Greg, sounds like something that you have for breakfast, or is that a frittata? A frittita. He is one branch of the famous Fertitta family. Fertitta. He has a couple of cousins, I think, who own the uh, owned a handful of casinos in Las Vegas. Not to be confused with the separate casino that Tillman owns and his cousins own the uh, Universal Fighting Championship before they cashed out for a couple of billion. But he agreed to buy the Rockets for a record $2.2 billion. And I don't want to really get into this transaction, but I was looking at this, Greg, and I was thinking to myself that sometimes in all of our lives, we got these things that we want, these things that we push for. I was recently reading about uh, CAA, Creative uh, Artist Agency, the agents out in Hollywood 
and about how Michael Ovitz, when he was running that, he really wanted to buy a sports franchise, and it was more about his ego than about anything else. And there's a lot of times that we've got purchases that are about our ego. And I'm wondering where that line in the sand is. I mean, for you, Greg, I'm sure you could just write a check for $2.2 billion and everything will be fine. Uh, it might be time to start cashing out if you're a, if you're an NBA team owner. And I know Leslie Alexander, who the, the guy who sold the team, didn't pay anywhere near $2.2 billion for it. So is it a toy, at least not entirely? I mean, in this case, we're talking about an NBA team after all, but I assume that there's if you're going to make an exorbitant purchase like that, then there's some idea of a return on investment. As to our daily lives, those of us who can't afford NBA teams, I think you've stretched too far if the expense doesn't pencil out. If you're intending a huge purchase as an investment, that is. But of course, there is such a thing as risk. You can stretch yourself too far in the hopes that an investment gives you a return that it never ends up doing. But at least there was the possibility of a return. Now, if you're spending money injudiciously, just for a pure indulgence, uh, fine, but there is never, ever an excuse for stretching yourself for a big purchase that just sits there taking up space on your balance sheet. I don't care if it's a Fabergé egg, Olympic-sized swimming pool. I, I assume that's what you had in mind. Yeah, I think it is. Paula, if, if you know, Olympic-sized swimming pool or, let's say, that sports car you've dreamed about your whole life, good purchase or waste of money? Well, I think one of the defining characteristics is whether or not you are going into debt for that purchase. Because if you're buying that purchase purely in cash, number one, you have passed the initial litmus test of whether or not it is actually within your like scope of what you should be bought. I don't want to use the phrase can afford, but you know, you've passed the litmus test for whether or not you have the money for it. And second of all, if you're not going into debt for it, then the alternative to buying that or, or the negative outcome of not buying that is that you could have saved more, you could have invested more, you could have lived more frugally. But that is the worst case scenario. But we hear about, Paula, you know, this idea of other people's money, especially when it comes to real estate, an area that's near and dear to your heart. But if I've got a real estate transaction that's stretching me maybe a little too far, but it looks like this dream come true, do you go ahead and leverage that and buy it? Well, so your initial question was about swimming pools and sports cars, right. both of which are non-investments. So for any consumer purchase, those consumer purchases must be debt-free, in my opinion. If it's an investment, I I still would not stretch too far when it comes to buying. I think that uh, the amount that you borrow should be comfortably within a, a threshold. And, and honestly, I think that thresholds, even that the bank set, are too high. So uh, I would be in favor of taking out a loan for it, but not too much of one. Well, let's talk about where too much is. Where where would you draw that line if the bank's too high? I like to have at least a 50-50 position. So I would own 50% of the asset, like I would have 50% equity, and I would borrow the other 50%. And I mean that, when I say that, I mean that for the entire portfolio of uh, re- real estate holdings combined. So it isn't that one particular house has to have 50% equity, but my entire overall portfolio of houses, I'd like to have at least 50% equity in there. Got it. So if you're above 50% equity right now, you'll you'll go ahead and maybe go 70 or 80 on another property is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. As long as the overall balance for the portfolio as a whole keeps me at about a 50% equity position, then I'm, you know, if my equity position is higher, I'm fine with taking out more leverage to ratchet that equity position down lower, the aggregate equity position. Len, so what that means is that uh, if you're on board with Paula in this 50-50 deal, that if you were going to buy the Houston Rockets, you'd only need to cut a check for $1.1 billion. <laughs> I guess if I get I you know what I don't know. Joe. But, but let me what? let me say this though. I, you know regarding homes to me that's one area where you would stretch and let's put it this way I don't look at a home especially the home I live in as an investment it's my home. But when I was younger when I bought my last home here I stretched. I stretched as far as I possibly could because I knew I was going to be in the home a long time. And I knew I had a secure job, so it was worth it. And I knew eventually my income would catch up. So in that case, I think it makes sense to stretch, uh, especially if you're going to stay in the same place, in the same house for a long period of time, because I think it pays off in the end. That's not to say that I believe you should be stretching on lots of other things, but that's one big example where I believe 
firmly believe in stretching your income. Well, you know, I came to you last for a reason because there's an article that you had on your site before, and you've done this a lot talking about why different things are for suckers, right? And if somebody's a yeah. sucker if they if they purchase something. But but I'll give you a good one, like a hot tub. You know, you you had a you had a great article on your site about why a hot tub is for suckers and how you shouldn't buy a hot tub. But if somebody really has their heart set on a hot tub, do you stretch for the hot tub? No, you know what? To me, I mean, anything small purchases, I don't understand the point of stretching for a small purchase. I mean, just have a little patience. If it doesn't cost that much money, wait. I mean, wait an extra month save or to save whatever you need. I, you know, I don't I don't see the point of stretching for small items. But the potential Going, damage. But wait a minute, Len, the potential damage on stretching for a small item versus stretching for something like the Houston Rockets. I mean, the, there's a huge difference in magnitude if things go wrong. Well, the Houston Rockets is a different – now. Right. Mean, you're apples and oranges, right? right? So I agree with you. And and here's another area where you really should stretch. Mr. Uh, Frittata or whatever his name is, he had a chance to buy the Rockets in 1993 for $81 million, and he was outbid by who? The guy who he's buying it from now, Leslie Alexander. What did Leslie Alexander pay? $85 million. So if Mr. Frittata would have stretched his income just by 6% back then – yeah, that I, I think that makes a sense. Those are like once in a lifetime deals. Yes, make a stretch for something like that. I mean, just think of the return on investment Mr. Alexander got because uh, Mr. Frittata didn't stretch his income. So to me, it's just, you know, you have to, there's a lot of, a lot of different variables you have to take into consideration. Greg, I love this talk of Frittatas, no matter what his real name is. It just makes me, <laughs> makes me super hungry. That is a 14.5% annualized rate of return for Leslie Alexander. Yeah, not a well, Over 24 can, years. You can't live on that. You know, you could have done better in a CD, right? Exactly. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Let's go to Quartz for our next piece. Uh, th- this one is written by Cassie Werber. This is a disturbing, disturbing piece. People in rich countries are dying of loneliness. And what this seems to say, Len, we'll stick with you because uh, you went last last time. Well, it's so- not because I'm closest to death. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It's because you're the richest among us, so you must be the loneliest. (laughs) Previous studies have found that as many as a third of Americans are lonely, and 18% of UK adults felt lonely always or often. The latest research, which collated studies in two meta-analyses, connected the issue of isolation to health and specifically to premature death. It seems, Len, that being wealthier might be tied to loneliness and dying earlier. Well, you know, I can I can kind of see that, right? Because if you have you have a lot of money, you have more choices and you can do more things and you can withdraw and you don't need as many people to be around. That being said, I don't think you can just compare and just say, hey, therefore, if you're wealthy, you're more likely to die. I mean, there's the other alternative too. people who are wealthy have a lot of friends. Right. I know lots of wealthy people who are relatively wealthy. I'm not talking uh, Mr. Frittata wealthy, but, but, you know, there's just a whole gamut of people. And so. uh uh, you know, I don't know. This is an interesting story, but I, I don't think you can draw any conclusions about richness guarantees you're going to live shorter. Quite the contrary. It seems to me most old rich people live to be live longer. Well, I'm less concerned, though, Greg, about uh, people living longer, shorter than I am about this concept of riches making you more lonely. You think being richer makes you lonelier? Well, first of all, I've never seen loneliness on a death certificate. Not that I've seen a lot of death certificates, but I, I don't think there's necessarily a trade off between wealth and a feeling of community. Me personally, I dream about being the last man on earth, living on a planet full of dogs and cats and no humans. And also, I think that this is a little tautological and self-fulfilling. The longer you live, the more of your friends are going to eventually die. Yeah, that's what I wonder, Paula. Is this a false, uh, is this like a false statement that, that I'm drawing a conclusion that really isn't a real conclusion that if you're richer, you're probably lonelier? Well, I think that we're conflating individual in, – in this discussion, we've been talking about individuals who are rich or families who are rich. And this study seems to be very much about cultural practices within rich countries. And those cultural practices include having smaller families, which means fewer people, fewer family members come to visit you, decreasing marriage rates, higher divorce rates, et cetera, et cetera. And so it makes sense that those cultural practices – could correlate to loneliness just because, you know, you have a smaller family. And 
your family has greater mobility, which means they're more likely to live in different cities and therefore visit less often. Well, this is something I wanted to ask you is uh, down at the bottom of the piece. It says that the researcher suggested some ways to tackle the problem of increased early mortality. People should prepare for retirement socially as well as financially, because so many social ties are now connected to the workplace. So you retire and you lead the workplace. If you're going to prep socially for financial independence, Paula, what does that look like for you? I think a lot of it is identifying what interests or hobbies you have and then joining social groups that are based around those. So if you're really into playing soccer or knitting or surfing or you know, whatever it is that you're into, golfing, find social groups of people who share the same hobby because you can't just default into friendships with your colleagues the way you could at a, if, if, yeah. you had a, if you went into work every day at an office. You know, the same is true not just for financial independence, but also for self-employment. Same thing. If you work from home, that means you're alone all day. So it's up to you to be proactive about joining communities. It's funny. I had this talk recently that I talk to people all day on the internet, but I work by myself most of the time and it can be incredibly lonely just sitting here mm -hmm. in a room tucking on the mic. But Len, let's, let's talk to you because not only are you the oldest guy in the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> I just got to bring that up every episode, don't yeah, I? Thanks. But, but you've seen a lot of people retire. You work for the man. You've seen a lot of people retire. You have to see people that struggle with this, this idea of preparing for retirement socially as well as financially. Yeah, I think a lot of people, they just don't think about that kind of thing, but you have to do it. Let me take my father-in-law, for example. He's retired, and me and the honeybee, we are constantly harping on him to get out there. He, he sits at home. His only contact is with us. He comes to our place, and we have him over dinner, and, or we take him places, but but we tell him, hey, go out. Go hang out at the, at the Foreign Legion, or, or go, you know, go the golf course and, and find a partner to play golf with, you know, you know, he just didn't think about it when he retired and he's at home. So yeah, you really have to think about that kind of thing before you retire. And I think Paul is right. I, part of it is your hobbies centers things around your hobbies that you like to do. Greg, you're a guy who's significantly younger than Len. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, you know, this idea of preparing for retirement social as well as financially, I think maybe this idea of, of preparing for retirement overall is overrated. I think that maybe we should be we should be getting out there today, don't you? I think Len meant that his father-in-law should hang out at the American Legion, but the idea of him oh, yeah. enrolling, <laughs> enlisting in the French Foreign Legion. I'm and getting old. <laughs> and, and going to put down armed insurrections in North Africa just seems... <laughs> that, that, that would definitely take up some of his time, I'm sure. It'd be more interesting, though, if he hung out with the people at the Foreign Legion, wouldn't it? <laughs> multicultural, uh -huh. Greg. It's a multicultural group. I I can't say that it's a bad thing to to plan for your retirement and to err on the side of maybe spending too much time thinking about your future rather than the present day. I mean, yeah, live in the moment, but God, everything in moderation. I don't know. Yeah, amen. Oh, got to take a quick break from our awesome conversation with Greg, Paula, and Len to say a big thanks to everybody who's gone to our sponsor, FamZoo. You know, this is the time of year with kids going back to school that we think often about their education. And you know what? FamZoo is the answer for their financial education because it is a financial education system, an award-winning app and prepaid debit cards all rolled into one. And I know what some parents are thinking, prepaid debit cards, why do my kids need those? Your kids are growing up in an age of plastic. And if you have the ability to let kids make their own purchases in plastic early on, where they can't overdraft, they can't run up debt, you can also move money to them if there's an allowance or they do some things around the house. They bid up some jobs. My friend Shannon, who runs the heavy purse, she posts a jobs board. And when those jobs are done, people like her can move money over in FamZoo to pay them very quickly using the app. You can keep an eye on their activity. You can even lock their cards if you need to. It's the perfect training wheels for bank debit cards or for credit cards later on that you know are coming for your kids. Safer and better track than cash, which kids can't use online anyway. Better yet, FamZoo has educational features to teach kids about compound interest, budgeting, managing expenses, earning money through hard work, and lots more. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash FamZoo. It's like Family Zoo, F-A-M. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash FamZoo for more information, whether your kids are in kindergarten or college. 
go get some fam zoo to teach him how to stack some Benjamins. All right. I first read about Hippo online and I was immediately intrigued because when it comes to your homeowners and not even your homeowners, I would see a doctor the other day and most of the form that I was filling in was baloney. And I even told the doctor when I went back there, I'm like, you know, you could have somebody see that and, and they could totally make this process easier. Like, why did I sit out there for 20 minutes filling in all this stuff? Number one, that you probably already have someplace else. And number two, that you can, you can easily find about me or number three, that you're not going to use. And it's funny that fintech companies like Hippo are using that as their advantage when it's so easy for companies to solve the problem. What's funny is I told the doctor, the doctor totally agreed with me, went, yep, yep, I agree with that. And I said, well, the reason I'm telling you is maybe it's worth 15 minutes of having an admin look at that. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure would be. I could tell it was like, uh-huh, totally agree with you. Not going to change a thing. Well, guess what? They don't change a thing in a company like Hippo when it comes to your homeowners, changes everything, which is why uh, I wanted to talk about them on the show. So let's do this. Let's talk to two of our friends from Hippo coming down to the basement. And coming down the stairs right now, Team Hippo, Asaf Wan, and Rick McCatherine join us. Have a seat, guys. How are you? We are good. How are you doing, Joe? Well, I'm, I'm great. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Because I love the idea. In fact, when I heard Asaf, we'll start with you, and I heard the idea for Hippo at first, I couldn't believe somebody hadn't done this already. But before we get into actually what you guys do, did you form Hippo out of desperation, or was it that you saw an opportunity because nobody was doing this before? Uh, it's mostly opportunity for me. I'm usually attracted to big areas that are ripe for intervention and change and stuff like that. That's what usually excites me as an entrepreneur. You know, I don't think there's a lot of fields that are bigger than insurance and that I truly believe that are, are more ripe for that. With that being said, I'm a second or even a third generation for insurance and Rick as well, by the way. I lived within the industry for a long time. My dad was uh, an insurance executive. And in many ways, I always used to think that it's kind of broken or at least that the current offering was just not right for me. It might be right for some people, but just not right for me. And and this whole thing boiled within me. And I thought, uh, you know, I can do something to change that. Rick, this idea that somebody's innovating in this area of insurance must have been exciting to you, too. Yes, it's super exciting. I got to tell you, I've been in the insurance industry for 25 years and the industry itself, even as an insider, has frustrated me because as the world has changed and as consumer buying habits have changed and technology has changed, our industry really hasn't. So uh, when uh, when I met us off and we started talking about things that we could do differently in the industry, frankly, I got excited. Amen. Well, I did too when I went to the website, myhippo.com, and I saw that you can save up to 25% on your home insurance. Let's talk about how it works. So, Asaf, if you walk me through it, I go to myhippo.com. What happens? The way that we look at technology, we basically think that an individual shouldn't really care about that. You, as a customer, you shouldn't care what I'm doing behind the scenes. It's like, uh, you know, the duck or, uh, on top of the surface, it should be calm and collected, and we are moving all of the wheels be, uh, you know, below the surface to make it easy for you. So we basically analyze several things. One, almost exclusively, home insurance is sold via an agent. This transaction takes 72 to 96 hours. You're calling them. You're giving them some info. Most of the time, you don't have the info to even give them. They're asking you, on average, 61 questions. How far you are from a fire hydrant in the wall material, shape of the roof, materials of the roof, what percentage of room in the house have crown molding, ridiculous questions like that, that you have no idea how to answer. It's not just that you don't know how to answer it if, if you live in your house for 20 years, Joe. It's the fact that most of the time people need to purchase homeowner insurance when they're just getting their first home or they're just uh, signing for a new home. So you don't know where the bathroom is. Put aside, you know, what percentage of the rooms in the house have wood floors and stuff like that. So we thought that, A, we can potentially negate some agents. A lot of people, and especially younger people or even, you know, non-younger uh, people like me and, and Rick, simply don't want to have an agent to sit in our house on the sofa and I need to give him a coffee and they're just trying to sell us life insurance, but they're right. taking advantage of the fact that we put them in our home to, to basically do an inspection. So we thought, I, I need to do it in my own time, in my own, uh, you know, living room. 
get all of the needed info. I can negate the agents. I can pre-fill all of this data for the individuals. There's a lot of data sources and we do all of the magic behind the scenes for you and we pre-fill it. You basically enter your address. Most of the stuff is being pre-filled. We just confirm some questions with you and we're within around 60, 60 seconds is the average to get a quote and around four minutes or three minutes, 45 seconds, most people are actually binding and get their policy in real time uh, online. Three to four minutes. That's amazing. Rick, when it comes to the, the things that Asaf is talking about, I want to go into that 65 questions that he talked about. How were you able to get rid of so many of those questions, Rick, so that you could boil it down to the ones that just mattered? Yeah, great question, Joe. The reality is we still get the same information. So we use a combination of data sources that help us get that information without creating friction and asking the customer. A perfect example is how old is the roof of your house? Everybody asks that question when you take out an insurance policy. And to a soft point earlier, unless you were in that house when the roof was replaced, you have no idea how old that roof is. So now we frustrated you because we need an answer that you may not have. And then we're, we've created an environment where you feel like you need to say something. So what we use is we use a combination of data to eliminate that question, but we still have the answer and it makes the whole process much quicker. How do, how do you get the answer? I mean, that's what everybody right now, Rick, screaming at their device. How much Big Brother is there going on here? I'll take this one. Sure. So on this one, it's a combination of several things. There's a database of every permit that was ever given to any house. So if we've seen a permit, then we use that. Additionally, we use aerial imagery to actually uh, look if you have a swimming pool, if you have a trampoline, uh, see the real condition of the roof and the material of the roof. Now, it's not done in a negative. If anything, it's done in a super positive. It's not just to negate the question and pre-fill it for you. We also do it as a proactive thing. So every customer of ours, once is onboarded and now is our customer, every time we take aerial imagery, we run all of the homes that we have within that database. And now we're going to tell you, Joe, we actually seen there is a discoloration of the roof and the material of the roof and the, the quality of the roof has been deteriorated. I actually think we should send a roofer. Uh, so we'll keep on monitoring your house to faults and if there's issues that are up and coming and arising. So we think that one of the aspects in, in insurance is that instead of being a static product, which is just a snapshot at day one when you do the insurance, why can't we help you and keep on monitoring your house and help you with prevention? We give IoT devices, we give every customer water leak detectors to put basically where the washer and dryer to prevent uh, a random leak that happened and nobody noticed. We monitor your house on an ongoing basis. We send someone to your home every two years to clean the gutters, check the air filters, and do things like that. We'll give you a weather alert. There's a hailstorm coming to your house. These are the three things you should do. Let's celebrate your home anniversary. It's about how can we give you more confidence and shift some of the stuff to prevention and not just give the magical experience that we're focused on if you have a claim and we'll take care of you on that side. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is good insurance companies pay claims. What can we do as a good insurance company to help you avoid that claim? Because if your roof starts leaking, sure, you can get your roof fixed and, and we can take care of that for you in a claim. But we can't replace the photographs that the water damaged caused, the damage and, and problems with your photograph or your antique chest of drawers or something that's very important to you. So let us help you avoid the claim. When it comes to this idea of enhanced coverage, too, I know that you guys are doing some things with homeowners insurance that other traditional homeowners companies aren't doing and doing it for a lower fee. Asaf, what are those types of things that enhance your coverage? So it's a really interesting thing. So what we basically looked at is what are the issues with insurance? And we dissected it based on tens of thousands of like claim reports and stuff like that. And what we saw is that most of the challenges is not that the insurance company would not pay you for the stuff that you were insured. It's the problem that Joe actually thought is insured for something, but you weren't insured for it. And then you're getting really, really pissed and you say, listen, I've been paying you guys for nine years and I knew it's going to happen just when I have a claim. And we started analyzing all of these issues and we, we thought, you know what, let's see if we can actually uh, give you the most comprehensive coverage. So the things that we cover, which most insurance companies are not covered are, for instance, there's something called service line. So Joe, you have a tree in the backyard and after a while the tree lifted the sewage and you're coming to your agent and citizens in $11,000 damage. My entire sewage is broken. 
And yeah, but you never had service line, and service line is what connects the municipality to your home, and it's actually not covered because it's in between, and it's uh, who is exactly covering it, and basically you're you're on the hook for that. Uh, so we think that every person who has basically a backyard and a tree or or uh, a, a line of electricity going over his house and stuff like that should have this coverage. You had a surge of water coming from the sewage. Yeah, it's not really covered. It's called a water backup, and it's a different coverage. You bought a house from 1987, but the damage happened in 2018, and they're saying, listen, but the city of Palo Alto has passed three ordinance laws, and now you need more studs, another pillar, and stuff like that, and the rebuilding cost that you actually get insured is not covering the real rebuilding cost to build your house up to spec now. So we give ordinance. We give uh, equipment breakdown. You had an explosion of your HVAC, your furnace, even your fridge went down. We'll exchange all of that up to $100,000. It's all of these other things. We want to make sure that you are covered for uh, basically what you have in your home and in your life. And the thing is, we, we really have a belief that in today's world, a lot of the things are shifting towards stuff that you want to do and the stuff that you don't want to do. So insurance, what can I say? It's 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 on the... Basically, it's on the bucket of the stuff that you don't really want to take care of and you don't want to do and you don't want to, but you want to trust the people that are actually uh, insuring you that they are actively monitoring and taking care and they have your back and they're going to basically take care of you when you need that. And this is how we look at it is, is if I'm your brother and I'm taking care of you and I'm your trusted advisor and constantly we we'll keep on asking the question, how can I make your life easier? Can I bring you more value on an ongoing basis and not just on the time when you sign up with us and then nine years down the line when you have a claim? What's going to happen within this like day one to the nine years? And this is what we constantly kind of thinking, how can we take care of you? What other services can we give you? We're still an insurance company. We're not going to be your best friend. You're not going to constantly <laughs> want to hear from us, but we just want to hear in the right increments and the right kind of content. Right. Rick, you're in two states now. What's the rollout plan look like for Hippo? Well, we're very excited. We have a very aggressive rollout strategy. By the end of this year, we'll be in at least five states. Uh, we'll add at least a state a month throughout 2018 with a goal of being able to cover up to 80% of the U.S. population by the end of 2018. So uh, those of you that haven't heard about Hippo, you will real soon. And Asaf, I know that you're not resting on the product as is. Can you tell us? Because, you know, nobody listens to the show, so it would be our secret. Uh, any any innovation coming up you can tell us about? So the innovation is, uh, the thing is that we constantly innovate on the coverage, on what we give you, on reaching out and make your life easier. So it's more and more partnership on IoT device, more and more services that are coming uh, towards your way. There's a lot of interesting distribution plays. And we are constantly keep on fine tuning the data to help with the onboarding, to help with the monitoring, to help customers and make it as seamless and easy as possible for them. Uh, the site is myhippo.com. You guys also have a blog there if you want to check out the blog at myhippo.com forward slash blog. Uh, Asaf, Rick, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes and tell us about Hippo. Thank you, Thank so, you much so much for much. having us. I'm sure we're going to have more updates about Hippo coming in the future, but if you want uh, more about them, head to stackingbenjamins.com and you'll see a link to Hippo on our show notes page. All right, let's get back to this awesome discussion with Paula Len and Greg. Our last piece, we're going to go back to Greg McFarland's favorite, the moneyologist at marketwatch.com. Here's what we do. We give our panel the question that the moneyologist was given. We don't give the answer. We don't really care what the moneyologist actually said. We just want to answer the same questions because these are always entertaining questions. So here is today's questions panel. Dear moneyologist, I have a job that requires me to meet with clients frequently. Do I need to update my technology by purchasing a smartphone? You know, just as an aside, smartphones, the news just came out a couple weeks ago, now going for possibly over $1,000 for a new smartphone for the, for the latest uh, iPhone iteration. 
My current flip phone, back to the piece, my current flip phone sends and receives text messages, but it's a flip phone. I don't need access to email while I'm en route to a meeting. I bring my laptop with me when I'm away from the office. I can sit down at a coffee shop or a similar place or at a client's office to send and receive emails. I also like that once I'm on my way to visit a client for a scheduled meeting, they don't have an easy way to cancel with me on short notice because I don't check messages while I'm on my way there. But am I giving a wrong message to clients who take pride in always being busy on their iPhone by continuing to use an outdated phone? Paula, outdated phone, is somebody going to mm-hmm. think less of this person professionally because they're using, you know, 1998 technology? Yes, absolutely. In fact, when I read this, my first thought was like, Joe, did you pull an article <laughs> from the 2007 archives? I thought you were saying, Joe, you got to get rid of the flip phone. That's what I thought you were about to say. I'm asking <laughs> Joe, for a f- did you write this? Yeah, I'm asking for a friend, Paula. Should I get rid of the flip phone? Yeah, are people going to think less of you for uh, broadcasting right. over a shortwave in your mom's basement? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Never. Uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. Get rid of your flip phone. It looks unprofessional. And in addition to that, all right, this statement about clients don't have an easy way to cancel with me on short notice. Guess what? Your clients are not thinking about what phone you have, nor are they thinking about how often you check your messages. Their responsibility, as they see it, And you may disagree, but they, in their eyes, their responsibility is to send you that message. And so if they send you a message 10 minutes before a meeting saying, hey, got to cancel. Or Joe, if I send you a message saying, oh, crap, forgot that we're podcasting. Let me go sit on the floor of a bookstore. I'll call you in five minutes. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like hypothetically, uh, Mike's just not going to get that message. And so he's going to show up for the meeting. The client is not going to be there. And then he's going to sit around and twiddle his thumbs wondering where the client is. Or the client might send a message saying, hey, bad traffic. I'll be 15 minutes late. Mike sits around and waits for 10 minutes, gets up and leaves. The client shows up, you know, and then they miss each other. I'm sorry, but if you're going to be a professional, you need a smartphone. But I look at, Greg, I look at all the, I I hear what Paul is saying, Greg, but I look at all these apps on my phone. I mean, I'm looking, I got, I've got four pages of apps on my smartphone and Mike here in his letter has zero. And you know what a time suck, like a stupid time suck Mike doesn't have that I have because I have a smartphone. It seems to me Mike's saving time and money by sticking with this older technology. A, I know you don't believe that. You're just being devil's advocate. And second, this is a this is a milestone post by the moneyologist. I now hate Quentin Fottrell more than I hate Trent Ham <laughs> because the former has a bigger platform, moneyologist, to spew his nonsense. Another email to the moneyologist made out of whole cloth by the moneyologist. Okay, first of all, as to Paula's point, who still owns a flip phone? Now, there is an answer to that. It's not a rhetorical question. Flip phones are owned by old people and people who just don't care, not any kind of urban professional. If you own a flip phone and are thinking of upgrading it to a smartphone 10 years after the invention of the iPhone, then you're not exactly curious about new and unfamiliar technology. And furthermore, I mean, if he's going to create these fictional devices to as plot points for these ridiculous questions, No one needs to justify an expense like that or ask some idiot on the internet for his opinion on the subject. Mike in New York is disingenuous. Of course, I maintain that he doesn't exist, but that's beside the point. His objections aren't even well thought out. And yes, one of them, oh, by all means, carry your laptop with you everywhere you go. That's much more convenient than a smartphone. I wish Greg would tell us how he felt. Len, actually, it's funny. I've read bloggers that talk about this. Should I go back and get a flip phone because of the time waste, because of the huge time suck of all this stuff while I'm staring at my screen? You go to dinner with four people, everybody's staring at their screen. I got a flip phone. I don't even worry about that. You're, you got to agree with me. Come on. I do agree with you. And I, I'm, Greg, your broad based assumptions are wrong. I mean, I, I have family members who have flip phones still. So, and they're only young 80, family members. They're only young, 87. Young. Oh, right. relatively. No, they're in there. Well, one, my cousin Evan, he cares when he's proud of it. He's, he's a 37 years old, 38 years old. He carries one around it and he does it to save money and he doesn't want to be distracted by the smartphone. I carry a Blackberry for work. I don't own any other phones. And when my when my work is over for the day, that Blackberry is shut off and I don't carry a phone at all. I have no phone. And I'm quite proud of that. Actually, I'm still old. I'm one of the few old school people left. And I don't worry. You know, I see people so stressed out with their smartphones. They're constantly checking their smartphones. It's like an addiction. And I just look at these people and I'm like, what the heck? Is is that any way to live? 
I, I don't get it. It's not, you know, I know here I'm the old man talking right now, but this thing about cell phones being, if you don't have a smartphone, you're not professional, I think is totally wrong. It but, just doesn't make sense. The whole thing is get the, as long as you get the job done, however you do it, that's all you have to do. Yeah, Greg? If you were contemplating buying one, though, and if you had professional reasons for doing so, you would just do it. You're, you're not going to ask the money all right. <laughs> Well, I, buy, I, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's skip over that point. So, Paula, what were you going to say? So here's the thing. People are acting as though having a smartphone means that you have to have a whole bunch of apps on that smartphone. That is not true. Those are two separate discussion points. You could have a smartphone with only text messaging, an app for checking your email, and that's it. You could take all of the, uh, what are those called? You know, the apps that the phone doesn't allow you to delete. You could take all of those, shove them all into a folder, and then stick that on like the far, far, far screen, like screen six where you never see it. And then the only two things that you have on that phone is email and text messaging. That will solve both of your problems. It will not give you any apps that will distract you. And it will allow you to check email while you're on route to a client meeting, because that's something that if you want to interface with clients, you have to be able to do. Before we say good day to this podcast, let me ask you a related question, which is often in the financial media, they talk about buying a car versus leasing a car. Buying a car is the better way to go. It seems like this is a parallel argument, being a professional, leasing a car. Let's say that you're a real estate professional who's driving clients around all day and you need a new car all the time. Seems to me that maybe leasing a car might be, you know, might break this, this rule of thumb. Paula, let's stick with you. Leasing a car versus buying a car for a professional driving people around all day. Is that the same thing as Mike and his flip phone? No, not at all. A, I don't see any justification for ever leasing a car. B, I don't think that real estate agents need a new car. They need a clean car, certainly. And they need one that is, you know, not new, but like, say, less than 15 years old. But so long as the car is mechanically sound, it runs well, it doesn't have a lot of body damage, and most importantly, is clean, then 95% of your wow. clients are going to be happy with that. And the 5% who aren't, you should get rid of them anyway. I don't agree with that. Greg, do you do you agree with me that people are way more shallow than people are than, that Paul has given them credit for? If I want to buy a house, the condition, well, not even the condition, but the model year of the realtor's car is not going to, is not going to break it for me. But still, I think that the average person out there is, is fairly shallow about this. And they're going to look at the realtor's card. If they're driving a Paula's point, let's just have 15 years, they're driving a 13 year old car that is 180,000 miles, maybe, you know, a couple little scratch marks on it. I'm thinking this guy must not sell many houses. Or is just, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe has a fancy house and the aforementioned Fabergé egg and chooses to spend money otherwise. Well, what would you think if he drove up in a 72 Pinto? Right. <laughs> right. Led, do you think people are shallower than they're giving credit for? Yeah, I think they are. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you think that? I love how we've got. I would say that the confidence of the real estate agent matters a lot more than the condition of their car. So if they stand up straight with good posture, they look you straight in the eye, they shake your hand and, and they present you with a list of uh, number of properties they've sold within the past 12 months, that's going to go a lot further. So, and again, I, I will emphasize the car needs to be clean because you don't want an agent who's a slob. <laughs> so no French fries on the on the floorboards or anything like that. Exactly, exactly. Because a sloppy car indicates like lack of organization. But if your car is clean and in good repair, then it's fine. What are you laughing about, Len? I'm just thinking of picturing a, a clean 1972 Ford Pinto driving up and Paula going, I like it. You're organized. and Boy, you seem, you seem confident. <laughs> because you know what? you got to be confident to drive that damn car. You must be the most confident guy around. It was, it, it was like I heard a comedian talking about recently talking about how driving a minivan was like the perfect way to pick up women because it proved, number one, you're probably virile. And, and, number, two, and number two, you've got a ton of confidence to be able to drive that. <laughs> you gotta, yeah. So driving a minivan is like a chick magnet, right? 
But Paula, aren't you saying the same thing about Mike's flip phone? Like if Mike has the flip, th- that it's more about Mike than it is about his flip phone then. Oh, so I don't think that the benefit of having a smartphone for Mike is client perception. That is a partial benefit, but I think the primary benefit and the reason that I think that it is a no-brainer is because Mike needs to be able to send and receive email on a whim at a moment's notice without having to pull out a laptop and search for a Wi-Fi signal. You know, that takes a long time. It's not something that you can do in a couple of seconds, like from a subway platform or from a bus stop or from a, you know, while you're walking down the sidewalk to the coffee shop. And if he is going to be meeting with clients constantly, guess what? They're going to cancel or reschedule or have some kind of last minute crisis that comes up. And they're going to communicate that to him via text message or email. He needs to be able to check both quickly. <laughs> That's the part that got. Wanna, wait, I want to clear one thing up. So, Paula, you're saying a guy who drives a Ford Pinto that has a smartphone. Mm-hmm. That's cool. But yep. what if he and it's clean? What if a guy drove a clean seventy-two Ford Pinto, but he had a flip phone? <laughs> uh, well, does he? <laughs> I don't think I... <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, now he's not. Un... Now you wouldn't buy the home from him, right? Because he's got the flip phone. <laughs> I would be if he was a real estate agent with a flip phone. I would be very dubious. If he was a gardening contractor with a flip phone. That's fine. Actually, I know somebody who's a, a gardener who has a flip That's phone. funny. So you do distinguish the profession, though, when it comes to the flip phone. <laughs> yeah, because, <laughs> well, because in Mike's profession, he is constantly meeting with clients. But not with and- leasing a car. Let's say that somebody, and maybe the realtor was the wrong thing, Paula. Maybe it's somebody else that needs to have a new car. I can't think of one right now, but somebody needs a new car all the time. It seems like Ooh, that's conditional. Profession, I don't think that the idea that clients want a real estate agent with a new car, to my knowledge, that assumption has never been tested. I have never seen a single survey that verifies that. That just seems to be an urban myth that is put out there probably by the automotive industry so that people buy more cars. The only profession in which that, that I can think of in which a new-ish car is actually necessary is if you want to drive for Uber or Lyft because they require that your car be a certain age, within a certain age. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of offhand. Does Uber have flip phone requirement? I, yeah, I don't think. <laughs> can you can you use, can you be Actually, an Uber driver with a flip no. phone? <laughs> I think you have to have a smartphone to drive for yeah, Uber. Yeah, you'd have to. GPS. Yeah, you'd have to. You know, the part yeah. of this. You know, the part of this, Greg, that cracked me up was the part where Mike is like trying to shirk his uh, clients by saying, well, I didn't I, I didn't know you're trying to cancel on me. Like, I, I feel like he's selling vacuum cleaners in this letter. Again, starting with the bold assumption that Mike in New York indeed exists. I, I, I'm just trying to imagine him. Yeah, I got to respond to this email or got to respond to this text and then go to the drop down menu on his numerical keypad. Yeah. <laughs> God, you might as well mail a letter. <laughs> Press it three times for the C. Remember that? Oh. Dut, dut, dut. I got good at that, though. Yeah, that's funny. All right, guys. I think that's going to do it for tonight. Uh, that That's maybe our most awesome roundtable ever. Greg, let's start with you. Control your cash. Where can people get it? Uh, they can get it on Amazon. And I would tell you more about what's going on on the website, but I have to prepare for next week's roundtable. Yeah, that's that's right. He's got to get ready early for the next moneyologist. All we're doing next week, Greg, are three moneyologist columns. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Greg's like, oh, I feel I got to go study for a blood test instead. Right. Hey, can you get the moneyologist on? I know we got it. We got to have him and Greg on together. <laughs> <laughs> he and Greg and Trent Ham. That would be just fantastic. Uh, let's go to you, Len. What's happening over at LenPenzo.com? Hey, why do people come to my blog all the time? Because there's articles like four really stupid ways to pay down your debt. You talk about learning stuff. You're going to learn it in that article. That's awesome. And there's the article about the hot tub, about why you're a sucker Uh, if you buy a hot tub. Absolutely. One of the all-time most popular articles at LenPenso.com. That was fantastic. Paula Pant, tell me about that Afford Anything podcast. 
Uh, on the Afford Any, well, actually, first I'll tell you about the Afford Anything Instagram page. It's at Paula Pant, where you'll be able to see pictures of me sitting on the floor of a bookstore in Portland <laughs> with, <laughs> with earbuds in that are still tangled, <laughs> connected to a laptop. <laughs> oh, hoping that nobody sees me. <laughs> we totally. We're going to link to that like right now as we're recording. That is. I will. Po- I'll post it as soon as we get off I'm, uh, this call. <laughs> I'm. A, I'm a little upset that we I'll, didn't it'll hear. It'll take a little longer because I've got a flip phone <laughs> right I, I didn't uh i'm i'm a little surprised we didn't hear jerry the manager come up to you and ma'am oh uh, you're gonna have to uh <laughs> please uh, you're creeping out the patrons i don't know that's great and uh, uh, what about on the podcast uh on the afford anything podcast there are uh, as usual every other episode is an ask paula episode in which i answer letters and by the letters i mean emails and voicemails that come in from the listeners um, many of which, Joe, are with you. You don't get physical letters like we do that Doug brings down no, the mail? No? I don't. I did get a thank you card from a listener recently. That was that was cool. That is so nice. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's every other episode. And then on the episodes in between, we've got interviews with uh, Jay David Stein, also known as J.D. Stein. He's a host of the podcast Money for the Rest of Us. Love that uh, I've guy. also got an interview with Pete Mikaitis about how to be awesome at your job. You know, I, you know, I had a, I, got, I had a bad case of Pete Mikaitis once when I was uh, younger. You had a good, you had, you had a good fungal spray and got rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Is that what happened? I love Pete Mikaitis, by the way. Pete, I, I didn't. That was that was bad. Pete, Pete, we love you, but that is a funny joke. <laughs> Paula, back to you. So yeah, those are some of the interviews that are coming up. I've also I'm recording one uh, shortly with Robin Dreek, the author of The Code of Trust, about how you can figure out if people are lying to you or not. And let's have Quentin Fortrell answer that. Are you lying to us with these moneyologist columns? That'd be fun. All right, guys. Thanks for playing. Hey, you know what would make Greg really blow up? If Trent Ham wrote a letter to uh, to the moneyologist. <gasps> how, how, yes. How passive tense, Greg, would that letter be? <laughs> <laughs> He's already gone. He's gone. He's already gone. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, oh I really <laughs> We haven't even finished recording and he's gone. I haven't stopped yet. We're not done. Everybody's still listening. So it's so awesome. People finally get a look at what happens at the end of the Stacking Benjamin show. All right, guys. Thanks for playing. And everybody have a fantastic weekend. <laughs> when... hey, if you get that if you get that done, I want to hear that. Yeah, I want to hear that back. I will and I'm serious. In there. I'm serious. This is all staying in the show. So thank you. Thanks for playing, guys. Bye, Joe. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, hey, that's going to do it for this episode of the Stacky Benjamin Show. You know, we play a game on Fridays. And what game do you ask? Well, we're going to talk about that in a second. We're also going to talk about what's coming up next week on the show. But first, got to say a big thank you to everybody who's gone to Stacking Benjamin. Why am I thanking you? You should be thanking me because the average person who goes to Magnify Money, you know what happens? They say $450 on average. And so whether you're looking for a balance transfer, credit card, cashback reward, 0% interest on those cards, you better checking account, savings account, personal loans to get your act together, student loan refinance to lower the interest payments you're paying for school, or Got to have a ride right now and you need that all alone? We love cash for cars, but if you just can't do it, why not make that interest rate low? StackingBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Also, credit monitoring and identity theft, they talk about there. They also talk about their favorite budget apps. Their blog is absolutely phenomenal, run by the one and only Mandy Woodruff. But like we do at every show, let's take a look at savings accounts. So I go to StackingBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. I click on savings accounts get personalized offers. It's been 1.4%, like I said early on. And look at what we got. We've had two at at, uh, 1.4. Now we have three at 1.4. But here's what I love about Magnify Money. So Live Oak Bank gets an A grade on their fine print. I love the fine print score. They get an A grade on fine print. Minimum balance is $0, 1.4%. Dollar savings account from Dollar Savings Direct, also A when it comes to fine print, $1 minimum balance, 1.4%. But there's three user reviews. It's only three and a half stars. And I go and I look at those stars and I notice that Randy says, I tried to open an account, was denied because on my application, I used my full 
name, first, middle, and last. My funding account was listed under my middle name since this is the name I've used my whole life. I called them hoping to clear up the problem, was told I'd have to get a letter from my bank, sent to them saying I was who I said I was, and sent them a copy of my driver's license so I could appreciate their diligence and vetting. Very disappointed in the lack of customer service and fixing the problem. See? And then two other people, five stars, five stars. So, like the fact that I can see what other people are thinking, I also like the fact that uh, I'm getting 1.4% where other people are bragging about 1.2. Then the third one on here, Poplar Direct is new. Get this. Their fine print grade is an F. It's way too complex and you got to have a minimum balance of 5,000 bucks, 1.4%. So I can very quickly look at all three of these and know which one is is probably the one that I really want to look at. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. They do the same thing no matter which area of the site you're looking at, and they comparison shop over 92% of the products out there. Also, Stacky Benjamins is brought to you by our own courses. You know, we don't teach anything here, but if you want to learn about legally cheating on your taxes or saving half your income, imagine if you save 50% of your income. Imagine if you only save 45%. How great would those things be? Well, here's what we go over. I talked earlier about what we go over in the tax class. Here's what we do in our Save 50 course. We try to figure out what your magic number is, which might be difficult because you have take-home pay. You've got things coming out of your paycheck. We show you how to find out what 50 really means and then how to live on a shoestring without living in a shoebox. And then we talk about increasing your income so that it makes saving 50% easier. And then the mechanics of where to put your money once you have it saved. And finally, the tough part is how to stay on top of it and save half your income for the rest of your life. All that and more at stackybenjamins.com. Head down to Stacky Benjamins courses. It's learn.stackybenjamins.com forward slash save the number 50. That's learn.stackybenjamins.com forward slash save 50. Or just go to Stacky Benjamins and scroll down just a little and you'll see it right there along with our other how to legally cheat on your taxes course. All right. Uh, got those out of the way. And, and, and I love our sponsors. Those are such great resources. Coming up next week on Monday, we got a top five episode and it's a very special one. Pete Makedis, who runs the awesome project podcast. It's a project and a podcast, I suppose. <laughs> it's called How to Be Awesome at Your Job. And guess what? He's bringing that to the Stacky Benjamin Show from all the interviews he's done. What are the top five things that resonate? He's going to detail that for us. And then second, on Wednesday, Gretchen Rubin, four times New York Times bestselling author. Of course, the person who wrote The Happiness Project, phenomenal book. She sold over 3 million, well, nearly 3 million copies of her books. And she's talking about the four tendencies, the indispensable personality profiles that reveal how to make your life better. Of course, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show, which means that that's about 15 minutes of an hour-long show. And the rest of it will have some crazy headlines next week. We'll also have your letters throughout the Haven Lifeline, Doug's Trivia, and much more. All right, that's going to do it. Oh, we also play a game. We're in week number four of this particular game. Here's how it works because OG's not here. I entertain myself through this lovely little game. And the current game is this. Listen to the beginning of the episode, read the description of the show, and Look at the title of the show, and somewhere hidden in there is a clue. And I'm giving you one clue each week, and this week we gave you the fourth clue. So it's one clue each on Friday. Really kind of easy to find, this one. And after four, I think you might be able to get it. So here's what you do. Email me, joe at stackingbenjamins.com. And you know what? If you're the first person to get it right, we will put your name in the hat for a prize pack that we give away to the winner. And uh, past winners will tell you, we always have a lot of fun with that prize pack. All right, that's going to do it today. We'll see everybody back here on Monday. Have a great weekend. Go stack some Benjamins. Bye-bye. Special thanks to Asaf Wand and Rick McCatherine from Hippo for stopping by. For more on Hippo Homeowners Insurance, head to myhippo.com or our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Okay, Joe, please tell me Steve's going to use that I want a hippopotamus for Christmas song here in the credits. I mean, you cannot pass up this opportunity, right? Paula Pant appears courtesy of AffordAnything.com. Len Penzo appears courtesy of the cryptically named LenPenzo.com. 
Special thanks to Greg McFarland for unwittingly being the guy everybody loves to hate. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. What do you suppose they call that? A novelty act? I don't know, but it wasn't too bad. Well, that's a novelty. Ah!